Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're continuing our discussion of portfolio performance evaluation and considering a quite exotic, yet um, intuitive, measure of risk-adjusted portfolio performance, that is, the Martin Ratio, that builds on the ALSA index as the measure of risk. And we would also revise quite a bit on drawdowns, as ALSA index and Martin Ratio are uh, ultimately built upon the logic of drawdowns, and compare the risk-adjusted performance of a notable exchange-rated fund, uh, that is BlackRock, quite famous, and S&P 500. We all know that both the US market at large over the past five years and BlackRock in particular have done quite well. But has BlackRock done noticeably better than the market at large? This is uh, the topic of our today's video as well. So first of all, let's calculate daily returns for BlackRock and S&P 500, dividing total return indices today by the total return indices yesterday minus one dragging it across and all the way down, calculating all daily returns. And then we can start calculating our daily drawdowns. The procedure is quite simple. We start at zero, as we're not in any drawdown at the very start of our investment period. And then we use a simple max function to figure out whether we are at a new all-time high or whether we are in drawdown. And if yes, how severe this drawdown is. So first of all, we input a minimum function and calculate the following product. One plus the previous drawdown times one plus the current return and subtract one. That calculates the uh, buy and hold um, return of our uh, next day and we can compare it with zero and that would determine whether we are at an hour all-time high or not. So if this buy and hold return is positive, it means that our equity curve has reached a new all-time high, and that basically means that it should be reverted back to zero, as that's our new highest point that we calculate the drawdowns with respect to. And if it's negative, that is exactly the value of our current drawdown. Quite beautiful, isn't it? So it means that we'll need to input the minimum of this expression at zero, and that will do our job in terms of calculating the drawdowns. And we can quite easily verify that that's indeed what we want the drawdown formula to do, as here, two days of consecutive positive returns means that we are just updating our all-time highs uh, for all intents and purposes for our sample. And then, as negative returns kick in, we start calculating our drawdowns. Here, for example, BlackRock has drawn down 1.07% uh, below its previous all-time high. Then it recouped some of the losses, but is still in drawdown of roughly 61 basis points. And then it continues to remain in drawdown for several trading days in a row. For S&P 500, here we um, have a drawdown of eight basis points. Then we uh, go back to an all-time high as this particular positive return does um, fully counterbalance this negative return and then we are in drawdown as well. So we can see some notable similarity in the drawdown behavior of the two series, quite unsurprisingly, as those two um, are uh, from the same country, from the same market. But what we're interested in is to calculate some um, summary statistics that describe the drawdown behavior and the ulcer index based on those drawdowns and utilize them to measure risk-adjusted performance. For the numerator of any risk-adjusted performance metric, uh, almost any metric, that is, we'll have our excess return, which is return uh, excess of the risk for rate. And the current um, risk for rate for the US, um, annual yield of a long-term government bond, is 1.65%, so let's use that. And for our annualized return, we can simply divide the last value of the total return index 
by the very first value of the total return index, and bearing in mind that we have got five years worth of data, raise it to the power of a fifth and subtract one. Having an um, annual return of 22.17% for BlackRock and 16.31% for S&P. For maximum drawdown, we simply need to refer to the lowest minimum value, as those are negative, of those, uh, disregarding the initial 0% uh, percent observation and the, as that's 0% by design. And to represent it as a positive figure, we just uh, put a minus in front of the formula. And we see that the maximum drawdown of BlackRock is 42%, whereas the maximum drawdown of S&P 500 is 34%. So in this instance, BlackRock is quite a bit riskier than S&P 500. For the average drawdown, we use a very similar logic, calculating negative average of the drawdowns for a particular return series and dragging it across. Here, we need to consider whether we take in zero drawdowns uh, as being drawdowns uh, essentially or not. And here the concept is the following. Do we want to penalize our um, uh, return our portfolio or any particular uh, return series that is for the severity of drawdowns or for their frequency as well because if we only calculate the average of the negative entries here we would disregard how often we are uh, at an all-time high and how often we are in a drawdown so quite um, commonly and it's pretty much a convention in uh, financial practice we do take into account zeros to adjust for both the severity and the frequency of our drawdowns. And arguably that is reasonable as we can penalize by the severity of our drawdowns quite naturally using maximum drawdown, isn't it? So that is the logic why we do take zeros into account in the average drawdown formula. And here we see that the difference between the drawdown figures for BlackRock and S&P is even more striking. Here, maximum drawdown is a bit higher, yes, but the average drawdown is three times that much as the S&P 500 drawdown, meaning that BlackRock is quite a bit riskier using this particular metric. And as for the ulcer index, um, it can be calculated using the formula presented on the right-hand side here. And this formula is very similar to the semi-deviation formula that we use to calculate the Satina ratio. And actually, if you wish to learn more about the Satina ratio, um, these drawdown adjusted uh, risk measures that we are going to discuss in relation to the Martin ratio later on, or the conventional uh, risk adjusted performance measures like Sharp and Trainer, we have got videos on that. So check those out later on if you're interested. However, now we're interested in calculating the ulcer index, which is the uh, root mean squared error, basically, of the drawdowns. It is the squared sum of drawdowns averaged by the number of our observations with the square root taken there. So basically, it penalizes not only for the severity of our downsides, but also uh, by downsides occurring on top of other downsides. So for example, here, this downside of a negative 70 basis point would be penalized not only for itself, but also for the fact that it occurred when the portfolio wasn't drawdown already. And here we can actually uh, quite nicely relate those um, measurements, such as drawdowns or the ulcer index, to some uh, behavioral characteristics of investors that might use them as their risk measures or use them to inform their risk-adjusted performance measures. That is, you are not necessarily that interested in uh, your uh, drawdowns, uh, really, as an investor, uh, unless you are um, affected by disposition effect, for example, uh, whether you feel that um, it is um, providing quite a bit of disutility for you, seeing that your portfolio is below its all-time high. You can also conceptualize this sort of um, risk perception from the point of regret aversion, that you regret not selling your holdings at their previous all-time high, isn't it? But ulcer index has this um, evident in the calculation procedure the most, when you penalize your losses that occur on top of other losses, basically um, conceptualizing the fact that some investors might regret not selling 
um, their positions when they were performing uh, either well or not as poorly as they're performing right now. And that is a very neat correspondence between behavioral finance and uh, risk-adjusted performance measurement. So we can simply use the average and apply it to squared drawdowns, taking the square root at the end. And obviously we could have used the sum squared function and then divided by the count of observations, but this also works, returning an ulcer index of 14.05%, quite unfavorably comparing to the respective ulcer index for S&P 500. And finally, we can convert uh, these risk measures into corresponding risk-adjusted return measures, which are Kalma ratio for maximum drawdown, Sterling ratio for average drawdown, and the main hero of our today's video, Martin ratio for the ulcer index. And here we can do it quite efficiently by locking the row in our return and risk free rate, as the only thing that it differs in those formulas are the denominators, the respective risk measures. And we can compare these ratios for BlackRock and S&P 500. And we can see here that um, whereas uh, BlackRock outperforms S&P 500 uh, in terms of Kalmar ratio when adjusted for maximum drawdown, it does underperform quite strikingly when you use average drawdowns or the ulcer index as your risk measure. And that means that investors that conceptualize risk differently, that care about different um, facets of risk, different um, versions of risk, if we might say so, would prefer either of the two, even over the course of the five years where both have done quite well. And that's all there is for the ulcer index and Martin ratio and their use for risk measurement and risk-adjusted performance evaluation. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.